So I want to talk today about the nature of the problem, the problem being civil discourse. We find it difficult to do that. Uh, some of the typical solutions that are offered and why they don't work. And some atypical solutions that I'm going to recommend that are uh, perhaps going to work a little better for us. Uh, and then how do we implement that? The nature of the problem, as you know, is that people are more polarized than usual. Typical solutions are, let's not talk about politics. To some extent, that's a good solution because religion and politics are not really intellectual positions for most of us. For most of us, this is a pretty emotional kind of a topic. Uh, sometimes we want to only let the experts talk. Another way to solve this problem that we don't seem to be able to talk without getting mad, and, uh, we can follow Robert's rules or any other set of rules. Somebody can come and say, look, here's the rule. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. And if you start to do that, if you're swearing, if your voice is getting loud, someone will tell you, hey, hey, hey. Don't do that. So that's one way to address the problem. And if you have a strong moderator who can enforce that, uh, that can work. Uh, another famous American way to deal with controversy is to just vote. 51 of us want this and 49 of you don't want it. There's more of us than you. We can beat you up. So that's it. You just have to take it. If politics becomes so uncivil and so distasteful that no decent person will participate, then who's running the country? not the decent people. So the problem here is people get mad. So what we're going to do is we're going to get a sign. We're going to get Don Fraser over there to design us a sign. And we want to have a big font, a very big, bold font. Don't get angry. <coughs> Solved. But it's usually very expensive and disruptive to just smash the problem head on. It's guaranteed to uh, empower your enemy when you do that. It's a short-term solution and it relies on brute force because something is happening that you don't want to have happen and now you're going to stop it. And now you've taken a lot on your shoulders and mostly it's not going to work. And the big thing is it shows a commitment. So if somebody says, you know that Roseanne, she made a racist uh, tweet. Ah, don't worry, we'll fire her. So we fired her and now everybody can see that we took the problem seriously. Whereas when you take a more subtle approach, not everybody's going to know that you did it. So there are reasons why we do first level solutions. A rabbi, annoyed that his yeshiva students were devoting lunch breaks to playing soccer instead of discussing the Torah, he decided to watch a professional match with them to see what was the big deal. And at halftime, the students asked him, what do you think about this? I have a solution to your problem, he said. Give one ball to each side and they'll have nothing to fight over. <laughs> Uh, if you give one ball to each team, all the people on the red team are going to go here and keep shooting the ball at the poor blue goalie. And all the blue people are going to go over here and shoot the ball at the red goalie. Nobody's going to worry about getting the ball from each other. So it'll just be a whole different game. People believe that we don't get along with other people because we're different or because they're different and who they want to blame. So my neighbor's a Muslim and I'm a nominal Christian and we can't get along because this guy believes in Allah, you know, and uh, that's nonsense, of course, because the real God is Jehovah, you know. That's not why people don't get along. People get along fine if they're different. If we have food on the back and one plate was full of bacon and the other plate was full of uh, matzo balls with chopped liver, my Jewish friend and I wouldn't have any problem at all because he wouldn't be touching my bacon and I wouldn't be touching his matzo balls. The problem comes when there's one thing and you both want the same thing. Go to Jerusalem, you'll see a rock there. Islam considers that a holy rock in their religion. So do the Jews. Uh-oh. We don't have trouble because we're different. We have trouble because it's the same. Our similarities are what give us conflict. And that's what we need to understand. Our differences give us peace. It's our differences that enable us to get along. So there's a whole lot packed into this little silly joke. So now we're looking at something that's called a second level solution. Instead of like the way to get the ball is to get great big players so you can beat the heck out of the other team and take the ball. That's the brute force, the first level solution, which we are inclined to want to do. But there's a smarter way to do it, a little bit cleverer way to do it. The rabbi changed the incentives. He didn't go and tell the players to do anything different. He just gave me each a ball. 
It required him or somebody to intervene. There's no way the two soccer teams would have come up with this solution because their mind is wrapped around getting the ball. They can't see the option of us each having our own ball. It doesn't make any sense to them. We need somebody from outside to see something new. And what does this cost? I don't know what a soccer ball costs, but not much. And the solution is there for not much money. Uh, it's also more subtle and more clever. This is more like a free thinking solution rather than a temper tantrum. So uh, the downside of that is when you make a more subtle intervention, nobody necessarily knows that you did that. So you won't get credit for having done it. And if you're a politician, you need to get credit for the good things you do or you won't get reelected. So second level solutions are more subtle and you don't get a lot of credit, but they're way better because they cost less and they don't disrupt what's going on. You don't have to reach into the system and stop everyone. There are actually three levels. First is where you change the situation using brute force. We talked about that. You made me mad, you're yelling at me, so I'm gonna put a sign, no yelling. Second level solution is where we use behavioral economics. That's kind of what the rabbi was doing with the second ball. And the classic story about this comes from the uh, airport in Holland, I think. And uh, in the men's room, they have urinals. And what we're supposed to do as men is we're supposed to pee in there. And uh, we're not necessarily very careful, especially after we've had several beers. And that makes us pee more and pee even more sloppily. So the result is lots of urine gets on the floor. And urine's full of ammonia and ruins the floor tiles. So uh, a behavioral economist came up with this solution. They ordered urinals that have a little black sculpture of a fly built into them around near the bottom. And so when people are peeing there, they look down and they see the fly and they wonder, is, is that really a fly? Or can I drown that guy? <laughs> and because they're paying attention to where they're peeing, they saved $63,000 in tile repair over the next year. That's behavioral economics. That's taking a tiny little shift which caused the behavior to change. And you didn't change their will. You didn't put up a sign. You know, if you put up a sign, please don't pee on the floor, there are a bunch of people in our society who will go out of their way to pee on the floor, right? Because you get that reaction from people because we don't like being told what to do. But we're pretty interested in seeing what's going on with that fly. So behavioral economics is a lot smarter intervention. It's a lot more gentle. And the truth of the matter is the more we human beings intervene in anything, the more we screw it up. Everything we touch has side effects. If we can fix something with as little touching as possible, that's smarter. But there's an even better level. And it comes from systems thinking called change the context. And I'll give you a very quick example of this. I used to have a job in an office for a very short time. And in an uh, office, you're supposed to sit at your desk for eight hours because they want to phone you and have you pick up the phone right away. So they want you to be sitting right at that desk, but I don't do that. So they phone me, but I'm walking around somewhere. And uh, they like you to work for the whole eight hours. I have found this out the hard way. It makes them really mad. Uh, they like you to uh, fit in with other people and don't attract attention to yourself, you know? So I'm a bad office worker because I love to have everybody looking at me and I love to have attention, I love to take charge and I love to work for about an hour and a half and then go home. And these are terrible, terrible weaknesses in the office. But then I became a college professor and my job was to teach three classes a week and stand at the front of the room and everybody look at me and everybody write down what I said. So all the things that used to be a problem in the office are now okay or even desirable in the classroom. What did I change? Nothing. I changed absolutely nothing about my behavior, but I put it in a place where I think it's appropriate. That systems level thinking will get you to that solution. Here's Russell Acoff. He's the father of popularizing systems thinking here. He's still around uh, and he's an emeritus professor at Wharton School. The school was the first business school in America. It was there before Harvard.
And uh, he's the founder of this, and he wrote a book called From Data to Wisdom, and it gave us the idea that having a bunch of data or data, whatever you like to say, having all that stuff isn't even information, never mind wisdom. We have to get levels, levels, levels above it. And here is his classic example. Here we have a bunch of people standing around the elevator lobby. So they're standing there and waiting and waiting and waiting. And when they get a chance to talk to the property management people in the building, they complain. How are we going to look at this problem? First level solution, this is a hardware problem. We only have one elevator. We need another elevator. So what we've got to do is cut a 12 foot by 12 foot hole in every floor of the building, all the way down to the basement, and put an elevator. That's going to cost a lot of money. That's going to disrupt a lot of stuff. But by God, we stepped up and we solved the problem. Or, smarter than that, this problem is only happening at lunchtime. Everybody's having lunch from 12 to 1. So we'll send a memo to all the various offices and say, look, some of you guys uh, let your workers out 11.30 to 12.30. And some of you let them out 11.45 to 12.00. Some of you let them out from 1. And that, that's a peak demand problem. The people are bottling up in the system. And what we need to do is have staggered lunch times. But we can do better than that. That's what Russell Acoff told us. He looked at this as a customer service problem. The problem is we have a bunch of people whining about the elevators. The problem isn't that we don't have enough elevators. The problem isn't that people are gathering together in the lobby at the same time. The problem is they're complaining about it. How could we fix that? You put some TVs over the top of the elevator with some sports networks. You put mirrors all the way around. This cost approximately 3000 This is real. This happened. It's cost them around $3,000 to put the mirrors all around. Now people's so now nobody's complaining. Problem solved, $3,000. So this is why we prefer a third level solution. Hardly any intervention, hardly any cost. And we do it by re completely restating what the problem is. So how do we find a whole new way of looking at a problem? This we learned from Gareth Morgan. Um, and he's also still alive and around. He teaches at York University. He teaches about metaphors. And his famous book is called Images of Organization. If you look at your organization like a machine, you'll see your employees as like cogs. If you look at your organization as a big society, you'll see your employees like citizens of it and treat them very differently. What metaphors are you using to understand the situation? And that'll give you insights you did not have before. Uh, so the classic exercise is to look at a contradiction. Every problem everywhere is based on a contradiction. A and not A. The philosophers have taught us this is a problem. Something can't be true and not true. What the heck's going on here? So we're stopped, we're stumped, we're out of gas, we're I don't know. Find that contradiction. Explore metaphors for each of the sides of the problem, as it were. And then see if you can pull some of those metaphors together. And that's where you'll find a solution, an amazing third level solution. In order to do that, we have to find a contradiction. So we could pick many, but this is the one I picked. We want to have more civility in our discussion, but those clowns are pushing our buttons. They're calling me a libtard. They're saying that I, I don't care about anything but uh, you know, transsexuals or something. They're pushing my buttons and getting me going. And because of that, I can't listen to them. And I can't hear their view. And I can't be civil with these clowns. So there's a contradiction. How are we going to get past this log jam? We're stumped. He says, you have to figure out the metaphors. So here's how we do this. This is called doing the pigs. It's kind of fun. What is that thing in the middle there? It's a pig. What if you're a farmer? Well, that thing is about $927 of income that you got to look after so you can keep your farm going. What if you're a little girl? Oh, that's babe. Come on over here, little piggy. What if you're a butcher? Oop, crown roast. That's pork chops. I got to cut them nice for my customers. Uh, what if you're a Muslim? That's haram. You can't be eating that. Muslims and Jews won't eat anything that came from a pig. Different people look at a pig and they see something entirely different. It's still a pig. And by the way, for any postmodernist here, there is a pig. There is something there. But we are all seeing it radically differently. You want more civility? It means you don't want to get angry. You don't want them to get angry. 
means you want to still be friends with this person. After you finish the argument, you want to go back to being pals. It means you want to get more wisdom. You want to understand what other people are thinking about these issues, because you, you might not be right. You want greater happiness in the world, as we all discuss with each other better. You want to include more viewpoints in every discussion, so you can hopefully get closer to the right answer. You want to understand those other people who don't make any sense to you. What they're saying doesn't make any sense to you. If somebody's doing something that doesn't make sense to you, that means you didn't get it. You better shape up. Or well, we can look at them. How come they push our buttons? Because they're stupid. Because they just want to be right. They don't care what I tell them. They want to stick with their position. They don't want to help and make peace. They're evil people who just don't care. Uh, or maybe I'm being too sensitive. Maybe they have a point. I don't know. Maybe they just have the wrong facts. I could tell them the right facts and we'll all be friends. This is called doing the pigs. And to find a solution, we need to find something on the right and something on the left that can go together. Like if I want to understand things better and those people want to be right, then I got to quit telling them they're wrong. Because, you know, they're not wrong in their head. They're obviously right in their head, so you need to figure that out. It's your problem to figure it out if you want to get wisdom. Or we could say we want to include more, more viewpoints, uh, but we're being too sensitive and we're getting angry, then we got something we can work on. The idea is you take some of these um, outlying things. At Harvard they do this differently. They call it um, getting past in, uh, positions to interests. So the union says we want 8% for our workers. They, they don't care about 8%. They want to get a big raise and they want the workers to love them and vote them in again next year. Uh, and the company says, we can't give you any raises. We're giving you nothing because we're going broke. Well, they don't need to give nothing, but they need to save costs. If you forget about the position each person has taken and look at their interests, the union wants to succeed and get renewed. Uh, the company doesn't want to pay any money. Well, maybe the company can provide a benefit, like maybe we can all shop in bulk because we're such a big company and we can get discounts. That'll benefit the workers. It won't cost the company a dime. If you get away from people's positions, if you ignore what people say and listen to what they're feeling, you can get to the solution. You know, if you go to a psychiatrist and say, I'm thinking of breaking up with my wife because she just won't leave my spoon collection alone. That's not the problem. Psychiatrists don't listen to what you tell them. They ignore that. And they look at your body language, the little wrinkles on your forehead, beads of sweat, you know. Don't listen to what people say. Listen to who they are and what they're saying. So, or what they're feeling, I'm sorry. So what we can find here is that we both want to understand what the other person is thinking so we don't look like an idiot. We want to be correct. We want to be reasonable. Can we have a discussion with the explicit goal of informing each other so that neither of us looks foolish? Sure we can. What's stopping us? Hmm, something's stopping us. And what's stopping us is we think we're right. So here's some things to consider. What if the person you're debating with was your grandchild or anybody else who's seven? And if your seven-year-old said, I kind of like Hitler because he started the Boy Scouts by having German youth. You don't say to the kid, like, here's a whack. And don't you ever talk about Hitler again, you pig. Because the kid will grow up with a Hitler complex, because obviously your life seems to revolve around Hitler from this reaction. You say to the kid, well, I, I suppose he did, and he made wide roads, too, so the tanks could get around. But, you know, that's, there's other things he did that are really bad we need to talk about. So you don't argue with a little kid because you disagree with them. So why should you argue with this person? Make believe you're their psychiatrist. Just listen to them. Uh, we gotta burn all the Jews and we gotta take all the liberals and uh, put them on their own island somewhere. Really, how would that work? You don't have to fight for us. He can't put us on an island. Relax, relax. This is just talk. Pretend this is being broadcast live just when you're about to unload on this idiot and tell him what an ass they are. Imagine the cameras there. Uh, that seems controversial. <laughs> It'll come out a lot softer if you imagine you're on TV or maybe you really have an audience. Imagine you're examining a space alien, which in some sense people with other viewpoints seem like to us. So this guy, uh, he's green and he eats metal, mostly aluminum. Hmm. Am I supposed to argue with him? Make him eat steak? 
Be a spy. See if you can earn their trust. See if you can worm their way into their world so they'll listen to you. You know, uh, Doran Whitledge back there taught us something at one meeting. He said, you know, when things are going well, we're all pretty, pretty liberal. When there's lots of money and you got a plush job and you got yourself a new car and the economy's doing well, eh, I'd like to give a few bucks to the poor. You know, I'm going to give some money to the Salvation Army, whatever it is. And then when things get tight and you don't have a job, you get pretty conservative. All of a sudden you get pretty Archie Bunker-like. We're all conservative and we're all liberal. It's just a balancing act and we have to ignore the rhetoric. Here's a whole bunch more. Imagine you're not God, and you might be wrong. That's about the reaction I expected. <laughs> In fact, we are wrong about most things that we know. I'm pretty sure. 500 years from now, we're going to amuse the heck out of people. Report your reaction, though, if it's strong. If somebody says something and say, you know, you know, when you say that stuff, it makes me feel pretty mad. I'll tell you why. Because uh, I have an adopted, you know, niece, and she's gay. And when you say that stuff about gay people, you know, I sort of take it personally. Don't you know any gay people? And maybe that person does know some gay people, and they'll probably tell you, well, this one's different, you know, because that's how people are. If you need to, take a break. Count to ten. I want to say count to five if you were educated in America, but I'm sure we can all count to ten. So, <laughs> remember, it doesn't matter if you win. These aren't points. This isn't a debate. A debate is a silly exercise that people do at Oxford, and it's fun, and it's kind of fun to watch, and you can learn stuff, but it doesn't solve anything. If you bring a really great debater to argue that there's no such thing as gravity, and you bring a taxi driver to argue that there is gravity, there's a chance the good debater will win the debate, but it doesn't change the truth at all. It doesn't make any difference who wins the argument. It doesn't matter. If you're here to win, you're in the wrong planet. <coughs> Your goal is to have the moral high ground. Your goal is to have been the one who listened. Okay, that guy called me an idiot, he called me a, a dirty name, he called me this, but I, I was cool. That's your goal. Assume that those people don't mean it personally because most of the stuff they're saying to you, they don't even particularly know what it means. They're literally quoting something they heard on TV. And by the way, so are you. Try to fall in love with them. This is the neatest thing, and sometimes psychiatrists do this. Try to fall in love with that person. Imagine, like, uh, I'm in love with this person, I'm going to marry them, whatever. Yeah, they love Trump, well, we got to talk about that. So the problems will seem a little less serious when you do that. And also, you'll pay more attention to them, to how fast are they speaking, how tight is their voice, all that stuff. If you remember having conversations with people that you really love, you're really, really paying attention. Really, really. That's what you need to do in these conversations. Address their ideas. You know, that last thing you said, I, gee, I don't think that's a good idea at all. I think that could cause a lot of harm. Not, I can't believe you ascribe to that stupid idea, you animal. Obviously, the discussion is going to stop, and you're not going to learn anything. We're here to learn. Don't tell them to calm down. Don't ever do that. <laughs> Anybody who's ever had a relative who drinks, don't tell them to calm down. That'll make them furious. Don't tell them, hey, think about it. That'll also make them furious. Don't say, I know why you said that. Don't be Freud on them. You know, I see why you said that. Yeah, no, you don't. You don't. Notice when your knuckles get white. You're sitting at the table, you're making fists, and your knuckles are getting white, and your voice is just raised a little bit in volume. Notice that. Because, hey, here, hey, whoa, whoa, Jimmy boy. Shh. Whoa. Notice when you're getting upset. Try to control it or, or announce it. You know, talk about it if, it's, if you can't get rid of it. Notice when your voice gets tight, when your breathing gets heavy. And notice theirs also. Notice when they're getting mad. And back off for a minute. Don't keep pushing the point you're on right now if it's making them mad. Talk about something else for a minute. It's not hard if you pay attention to them as you would to a lover or to a psychiatrist's client. Pay attention, watch, see what's going on. Whenever there's a downward spiral, and we've all been in these, I, I personally think it's especially men, but I suppose it's true for women too. But if you see two 12-year-old boys in the schoolyard, you'll see one saying, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah, and the other one will be saying, oh yeah, that's right, that's right, and they're both getting ready to f they're both looking over their shoulder for a teacher. Hey, 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 come on. Somebody come and break this up, because, you know, we're going to end up in a punch-up, but I'm going to get a sore nose, my glasses are going to break, you know. 
right? We can't back down. But notice when it's spiraling like that and say, hey, 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 we're both getting pretty angry here. I wonder if we could just talk about something else for a minute or something like that. Because we're human. We're going to get mad. We're supposed to get mad. It's okay. Self-effacing humor often works. And make sure you validate the other person's feelings. So uh, uh, Trump finally saved us from these idiotic regulations that were keeping my profits down. Wow, you seem really angry about this. You seem to feel like regulations really hem you in and you can't be your best self. So validate that. Uh, practice on your friends and relatives at first because they won't punch you. So practice on that. Most of them won't punch you. Uh, practice on anybody who will listen. And a good place to have an argument where, or I mean have a discussion with someone you don't agree with is a very public place like a McDonald's or whatever uh, where most, for the most part you'd be too embarrassed to start punching each other out and if you do somebody will stop you or call the police or what have you. Always be willing to just walk away if you have to. If you really can't get anywhere just say okay sorry I didn't mean to bother you. Uh, De-escalate yourself and then we already talked about that. This is not a contest. You're here to learn something. There's something that you don't get about that person. That's your problem. Figure it out. Figure that person out. Have you ever been sure about something, but turned out you were wrong? Have you ever had to update your knowledge? Ever learned a new scientific fact? Have you ever stuck to a position just out of emotion, just got your back up? Have you ever been surprised by new research? How many planets are there? Nine. Now that, how many colors are there in the rainbow? Used to be seven because we were preoccupied with that superstitious number. Now there's six. Does your tongue have taste areas? Sweet, salty? No, that's nonsense. Do we use just 10% of our brain? Nonsense. We use almost all of our brain lifting our fingers. Thank you. <laughs>